Content warning. This series will discuss topics that may bring up painful experiences for you. Please take the time to surround yourself with good medicines. If need be, pause the playback and go for a walk, stretch, have a glass of water, and come back to the show when you feel comfortable. Welcome to the Métis Speaker Series. I'm your host, Darian Kovacs. On this podcast series, we will be exploring learning, healing, and rebuilding within the Métis community. Our goal is to create awareness of and generate discussion about Métis issues, as well as how to heal from and move forward in a healthy way. We hope to reduce Métis invisibility in BC through the personal stories from our Métis community members. This show is brought to you by Métis Nation BC and Jelly Marketing. Wayne, thank you for being here. Uh, why don't we start off? Tell me a bit about yourself and uh, how you got to uh, where you are today. Well, Tanji Kiowa, Wayne Wapimakwa de Shini Kashin, and Blani Baba, Pien Michif Nimama, Vancouver Niwikin, Maka Langley Dos Chin, and Blani Baba, Pien Michif Nimama, Nimama Mushroom, a turtle mountainous Chiowa, Maka Ni Mushroom Kia Pikiwa South Bend, P. Bearthorpe Schindler, P. Lenur Minunda for me. Inan. So, howdy, folks. My name is Wayne Wapimakwa. I'm a Métis citizen. My dad is white. My mother is Michif. And our historic Métis family names are Bearthorpe, Schindler, and Lenur. And my grandfather, who is Métis, is from southern Saskatchewan around South Bend, where he was raised by his grandmother, Mary Thorpe, who was treated at Turtle Mountain. Now, I was raised away from those homelands on the West Coast on my family sheep farm where I continue to go to ceremony with my local Métis community here in Vancouver. And at the moment, I'm finishing up my PhD at the Pennsylvania State University, where I'm working on a project to do with um, new discourses around land, race, and gender in the 19th century, and how these new sorts of languages serve to dispossess Métis peoples. Wow. And what brought you to choose that as your topic? Well, yeah, obviously I have an existential interest in this as a Métis person, but recent events have directed my gaze back through time to the historic dispossession of our people in order to try to make sense of some current events that we're experiencing as a nation today. Obviously, there's a lot of political strife within the large Métis community. At the federal level, as well as the provincial, there's a tremendous amount of infighting and finger pointing, um, not to mention the sort of waves of race shifters in eastern Canada who are claiming Métis identities. On the whole, we could say that times today are looking extremely contentious. And so as a means to try to make sense of that, I thought that we would look to the past at how these sorts of fights were almost presaged and prefigured by things such as the road allowance period where certain divisions were created between our people as a result of the federal government's so-called Indian policy and whether or not we can make sense of today's infighting with that historical context. And um, just before continuing, I think it's important for me to also state up front today that we're going to be using some racist words um, in order to describe my research and get to the bottom of these sorts of things. It's not my intention to hurt anybody's feelings nor to degrade anybody, but I will be using some of the terminology that is germane to the 19th century just to remain contextually specific. So I apologize in advance about that. Wow. So that was your motivation. And and what does it look like now? How did you kind of like, you know, as they say, crack open the book or where did you start investigating? You know, you put on your whatever Indiana Jones hat and started adventuring and, and discovering this uh, this history. Well, I've been very, very fortunate to have some incredibly gifted mentors helping to guide me on this process. Aline Laflamme is an elder who I work with um, here on the West Coast. Yvonne Chartrand is another person who I look to for inspiration. But academically speaking, I've been thrilled to have the mentorship of Brenda McDougall, who's working out of the University of Ottawa. And she's been one to direct me 
to various researchers, various authors, and periods that I might want to look into. So at her behest, I started to look a bit more into the sort of like race laws in the 19th century after the Tosh, after Red River in 1869 and 1885. And what were the sorts of things that Canadians and specifically Canadian politicians came up with in order to continue the project of dispossession? So I would look at the race laws, look at censuses, look at personal letters written between my family members at that time in order to try to investigate how they identified and also how they wanted to navigate and get around some of these racial laws in order to just make a home and a living for themselves. Wow. So if I, I look back just personally, my, my grandfather passed away. Uh, my aunt decided to make a, a beautiful kind of PowerPoint story of his life and, and discovered uh, scripts and, and found two of them. Oh, yeah. And, and so, and, and the term, of course, half breed was put on there. Tell us about yeah. those, those, those documentations that my aunt found and, and, and probably many Métis people have found across Canada. And, and what does that mean? And, and what did the government mean with those pieces of paper? Oh, of course. Yes. This is indeed, I think, the greatest um, or the most important event that we could consider as Métis peoples from the 19th century. So following the resistances at Batash and Red River, uh, a protracted series of treaty negotiations throughout the Northwest took place. So treaties were negotiated between the federal government and First Nations peoples, but the Canadian government wanted to develop a specific policy geared towards the Métis. Now, the first question you might have is, why would that be the case? Because at this time and place, it was almost indistinguishable. Métis peoples and First Nations were to large extents indistinguishable. They were mediating between each other. They were trading. They were living with one another. Many of my Métis relations were living on reserve and, in fact, co-signed treaty as well. And yet today we find very, very, um, we find distinctions between these groups that did not formerly exist. Indeed, at this time in the 19th century, the most fundamental distinction wasn't between settler and native or Métis and First Nation or quote-unquote Indian and half-breed. It was between family member and non-family member. So how was that difference replaced by the difference we see today where we recognize people as First Nations versus Métis or vice versa, right? Scrip, as you mentioned, was the specific way that Canada wanted to extinguish Métis identity and deal with us in, in distinction from First Nations peoples. So let me just say one or two quick things about that, about the aims of that policy. So. Treaty negotiations were collectively negotiated between First Nations and the Canadian government on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. Scrip, what's known today as half-breed scrip, was negotiated between Métis individuals and the Canadian government. So what the government did is they sent folks around throughout the Northwest in order to find out who was a real half-breed and who was an Indian, so to speak. And as you might guess, they came up with all sorts of ridiculous ways to create these distinctions. And indeed, one of the points that I want to make in my research is how these sorts of relations had to be invented. They didn't pre-exist colonialism. They had to be invented and drawn up. So what um, script commissioners would do is they would try to figure out who was half civilized and who wasn't civilized. Obviously, they would view First Nations peoples as less civilized than quote-unquote half-breeds because they assumed that we were partially white, partially French, or partially English, and therefore partially savable. And here I'll wrap it up. And so the idea was, in order to save what was left of us, they would have to turn us into farmers or turn us into property owners, hence the program of half-breed script, because being white was the same thing as owning property at this time. Wow. So if I look back at those two sheets of paper that my aunt found, I'm sure, and then maybe some people say, I, I wish I still had them. I don't know where they are, but maybe people are starting to share them collectively and finding them. But what would have been the process? Like, I, I want you to take us there, yeah. like kind of um, visualize us. So, and, and it could be my relatives or yours, but I'm at, talk about the person walking up and who walked up to them what was the, the back and forth like? I, I, I'm not telling you to, you know, make a, you know, made for TV movie here, but what, just to you know, visualize it for us, that process. Totally. Exchange. So maybe I can explain a bit of this with reference to one of one of my ancestors yeah, okay. That'd be great. Um, by the name of Amelia Bear. Perfect. And yeah. how she navigated these categories. So 
1876, Amelia, one of my ancestors, was living as a quote-unquote treaty status Indian on the Chief John Smith Reservation, which is a few clicks outside of Prince Albert today, known as the Muscadet Reservation today. So in 1876, she's considered an Indian because she's married to somebody who signed treaty. In 1885, the Northwest is open to scrip. What this means is that Métis people could leave their reserves that they're living on in order for privately owned scrip land. Um, this would mean that their indigenous status would be extinguished since, as I mentioned, owning property was the same thing as being white. And scrip was basically a certificate for 160 acres or 160 bucks. So you would go to the commissioner and you would say, yes, I am a half breed. And then they would say, okay, do you want money or land? You would pick one or the other, <clears throat> and then they would send that order and council off to Ottawa to get approved. And then it would go through some bureaucratic process and come back to you, hopefully. <clears throat> now, obviously, this isn't what happened. What happened oftentimes was that um, there were things like people like script sharks who were waiting outside of the tent, hoping that half-breeds could um, get their script and then they would steal it or buy it out from under them in all sorts of schemes. And this is well documented in works like Frank Tufts as their natural resources fail if you're more interested. But let me get back to the story of Amelia. So just to recap, in 1876, she's living on a reserve. And in 1885, the Northwest is open for script. In 1887, my ancestor convinces the script agent that she's partially white and therefore eligible for half-breed script. And you could do this through passing a variety of civility exams. Like sometimes you just needed to prove that you could read and write, and that would be good enough. Sometimes if you were just looked white, that was okay. Other times you had to tell them who your grandmother or grandfather was. But to be honest, it really wasn't that hard to get script because it was part of the Canadian program to dispossess people. If you can get them off the reserve and get them onto private property, or just extinguish their indigenous rights to begin with, you know, case closed. That was the objective effectively. And what happened is even people who took script, so maybe this is true for your ancestors as well as mine, even if you took script, you would still be racially codified as Indian. And this is exactly what happened to my ancestor, Amelia. So even though she took script in 1887 and was therefore considered white in the eyes of the government, in the 1901 census, she's listed as R for red. So what this means is that no matter how much Amelia and other Métis tried to assimilate, they were always thwarted in their efforts to become white people. They were always racialized as wards of the state and not civilized enough for Canadian society. But they were given land. Is that correct, though? Like that's, Was that a distinguishing factor? They were given this... So the idea here was, yeah, if we gave them land, then we wouldn't need to pay them any fiduciary obligations as a Canadian government. So you would go to the script tent and you would either pick 160 bucks or 160 acres. Now, here's the problem. OK, you don't get to choose where that land is. OK, most people took the money just because you would never even know sometimes if your if your script got processed. And if it did, you would have to wait months sometimes in order for that order and council to return from Ottawa. And at that point, you would be able to go down to a Dominion's land office and select which plot of land you would like. There are several problems with this. Number one, the sorts of land that you could pick wasn't really favorable for farming conditions. Number two, the plots of land were divided into small acre lots that were dissimilar to the way that Métis people had previously organized property. Previous to this period, we would um, build homes on river lots and have communally owned areas for timber and cattle grazing. But for script land, you might not get anything like that. You might get sent off 100 kilometers in the opposite direction of your cousin, even though they were right behind you in line. So it was a way to separate families, and it was a way to send them away to distant areas in order to disrupt their collective unity and their capacity as a people to unite one another. So there, it so was strategic then. It was strategic to, to, to oh, yes. separate the, the, this kind of organizing group, like a union almost. They're like, oh, the, the union is organizing. Let's break them up. Well, yeah, obviously, because put yourself back then in the 19th century. The Métis rose up in 1869, 1870, and were a real pain in the Canadians. And then they did it again in 1885, and who was to say they would not do it a third time? 
So we got to take care of this problem, said Sir John A. Sir John A. Macdonald. We got to take care of it in scarcity and sickness. And the dogs in Quebec may bark, but so will Riel. And so we got to separate them and put them into different parts of the country. Now, obviously, Métis people knew that that was part of the program, so often they took the money. And if you take the money, 160 bucks in exchange for your indigenous rights, it's a pretty deal, especially considering that none of your children would ever have those indigenous rights. They would be extinguished at that point. And then jump forward, 2022, or maybe you're listening in 2023, wherever. What's happening now? What what happened between then and now where now we become registered citizens, where I go and I registered at the Métis BC office, I got a card and I registered my children. Tell me about the, the jump and what happened since then. Oh, geez. Well, that's a whole nother can of worms there. The jump. Well, what we're seeing, I guess, this is all speculative. That is a big jump. So this isn't my area of expertise. Um, so you'll have to take this with a grain of salt. But what we've seen um, since this period is a prolonged era of Métis organizing. Because of our historic misrecognition and our historic racialization as, quote, half-breed and therefore half-problems and therefore half-people, we were pushed to the side and um, disenfranchised for decades. And you can look at Elder Maria Campbell's book, um, the road allowance period for infamous stories about this time and place when you have indigenous Métis peoples who are living on the sides of roads and shanty towns, living in like small areas on crown lands and parks without any sort of recognition on the part of the government. After this period, throughout the early 20th century, thanks to people like Jim Brady and Malcolm Norris who were organizing in Alberta, Métis visibility was raised to at least a provincial level. Now through the 50s, we have different movements like the um, Métis, different ver various Métis movements who broke off from First Nations movements in order to fight for our individual rights. And today you have these provincial organizations organized under the Métis National Council in order to uh, represent us. But even these are, pro these are institutions which are fraught with problems. There are many things that are tremendously beautiful about them and there are many things and challenges that we must overcome. It's, it's very nice to see maybe someone who has recently become a, a citizen, and, and which is what this podcast is for, or those that have been longtime citizens, to know the history of, hey, from uh, you know, you know, day one, day, I call it day zero to day one to day two, and then all the way up to today, and just the history of, of what's happened and why we can now get a you know, plastic card in the mail that says we're an actual citizen. Indeed, but I think that just because you're a new citizen doesn't mean that you're a new Métis, right? You were born Métis. This uh, provincial plastic recognition is plastic. It's something that can change and indeed is something that has changed throughout history, as my research shows, right? The definition of who counts as a Métis has been something of the government's concern since their first interactions with us, right? Um, Ultimately, however, in my opinion, I think that what makes somebody a Métis isn't their citizenship, it's their family, right? And it's these connections and this connectivity that we need to reinvest in as a nation in order to assert our sovereignty. And people that are maybe listening and, and haven't gone through the process of discovering their scripts or to find that history, is there, a, like the government, do they have a master script database that they can reference or, or go to? Oh my goodness, I can't believe I forgot to mention that. Yeah, so you were talking earlier about your relations, right? Yeah, it's all, it's most of it's online. Yeah, if you went to the Library and Archives of Canada website and they have an entire site dedicated to script. So you can go and you can look up your own ancestors and see how they were recognized by the government there, whether they took land, whether they took money, where they ended up. And for me, what I personally find so intriguing about this research is I want to compare the different race laws and the script policy as well. So how did script inform race policy? How did script actually create half-breeds? How did script create status and non-status Indians and create these sorts of divisions between people? Indeed, how did script also accidentally create a form of whiteness that we view today? A homogenous Canadian identity was created at this time and place by differentiating so-called whites from so-called half-breeds, right? Mm 
And so if you wanted to do some more investigating about this, about with respect to your family, definitely check it out online on the Library and Archives Canada website and go and find for yourself how the Canadians viewed your ancestors. It's amazing. And will you provide a link that we can include in the show notes? Does that work? Without awesome. a doubt. Yeah. Uh, so Wayne, take me back to the day when the government is in a room, maybe a wooden room heated by a fire, and they're deciding what to do about the Métis people. Someone came up with the idea of scripts. If you could have been in that room or you could have been the decision maker, and again, this is all fantasy here, what do you think the government should have done? You know, you're, you're so head deep into this knowledge and information and research. If you could go back and just change things, like you got a DeLorean, right? A, a time machine car. What would you have said and done if you had that power? Well, I hope my flux capacitor would continue working, first of all, because getting stuck back then would not be fun for me. Um, well, I guess the question is, what would I have done depends on whose perspective you're asking me to speak from. Because if I'm John A. McDonald, I think he did a pretty good job of being a white supremacist. Am I allowed to say that online? So, I mean, he did a pretty good job for his objectives. His objectives were to attempt to destroy Métis collectivity and attempt to extinguish our identity. Then again, I think you and I and our nations and our relations and our other Métis comrades and friends are testament of the fact that he failed, right? The era of half-breed script, we should be unflinching and we should be serious and truthful in calling it what it is. It is a period of cultural genocide. It is a period of cultural genocide. And yet, it is also a story about how cultural genocide has failed because we are still here and we are resurging and we are back, baby. Okay, we are back to the future. So in terms of what I would have done, I think that it was hard at that time for us to organize. We were disparate. We were far flung between different areas. We weren't organized. We were, we were not successful in seeking these sorts of political alliances that we should have with First Nations. And this is all due to the Canadian Indian policy of divide and conquer, right? So it's hard to say what we could have done in that time and place other than organize and seek counsel with our relations and try to seek comradeship with our First Nations kin. It's incredible. And again, if you were um, walking around, what, what would that look like? What kind of maybe paperwork would you have done? What sort of um, practical things would that have been? Um, again, if you, yeah. Oh my goodness. I think um, it's hard for me to describe because I have a diagram of what's involved in a script commission. There's five different phases to getting script and about three to four different forms. And it involves sending a commissioner from Ottawa throughout the Northwest, proving to him that you're a half-breed, him sending that form to Ottawa, it getting approved, it being sent back out to the Northwest. You would have to go to an office then to accept the document and prove that you were the person written on the deed. And then you would have to activate that script in order to acquire your land. And that little part at the end there is very, very important. So if you were someone who wanted to get script land and say that was successful, you were approved, you would have to prove to the guy at the office that you were indeed the same person written on the deed. At that stage, much fraud took place and it wasn't complicated, okay? It was as simple as dragging in an indigenous person and claiming that that was the person on the deed. They would get the script and then the white person who was trying to take the land would simply take it and run away. And that was that. It was just impersonation. Oftentimes we were scandalized. We were, we were um, usurped out of our territory just through mere impersonation and avarice, effectively. And this process, it's important to also insist that this process of filing paper, sending it back and forth in order to get land, was intentionally set up to be bureaucratic and confusing. It was intentionally meant to obfuscate and confuse people who didn't recognize such differences in the first place and just wanted to survive and do what they could to put food on the table and roofs over their heads. And it was the Canadian government's policy to stop that as much as possible by making it complicated. That's, that's <clears throat> wild. And, and so for you, as you're digging into this, where will it go now? Where will your doctorate uh, be published? Or, or what's your plan to do with this? Or what are you hoping for out of this experience? Well, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, um, I'm still at the very... I'm still scratching the surface here 
but I'm hoping to continue writing my dissertation, which I'm calling at the moment Partisans of the Soil, Land, Race, Gender, and Métis Dispossession, 1870 to 1920. And the idea of the dissertation is to kind of put um, settler colonial studies on its head. So when we talk about settler colonialism and these really intense concepts about dispossession and genocide and such, we often focus on what the settler state took from indigenous peoples, and rightly so, obviously, rightly so. But what I'm trying to do is look at what it gave. And I'm not saying that in a, in a generous light. What I mean is that in order to dispossess indigenous peoples, and specifically Métis peoples, because of our unique racial status with respect to the government, what I'm looking at is what the government had to give us in order to take from us. It had to give us a new racial identity in order to differentiate us from First Nations, in order to divide and conquer. And that's where we see the category half-breed first come up, right? So that's the general thrust of my dissertation is how did the government give us, you know, in scare quotes, let's be sure here, give, quote, us, race, land, and new gendered institutions as well, right? Because, as we know, women occupied historic leadership roles in our communities and continue to do so to this day. But the government obviously did not like that since it conflicted with their Victorian patriarchal mentality and the fact that in Europe, of course, it was the men who ran the house. So how did they have to replace our feminist indigenous structures with ones based on hatred patriarchal exploitation? And one of the ways in which they did this is obviously through script, because the head of household was the one who would redeem script for his children, right? What is a head of household, right? That is an entirely new Victorian invention. There was no such thing prior to script. The head of household is an invention. It is a so-called gift of settler colonialism that was meant to take from us. Wow. And and for you, as far as kind of like the next five years, what would you hope this research does or this information? What do you hope it does for, for maybe Canada and the Métis people? Well, I'm hoping to do a bit more investigation, like I said, into our history in order to lend a bit more light to our current situation. Because what I'd like to see today is I'd like to see us come together on a national unified basis, on the basis of our interconnectedness as kin and as disparate indigenous peoples who nonetheless share a common ancestry and share a common family history. And what I'd like to do is do delve a bit more into our historic dispossession so that we may today repossess our heritage and repossess our land and place um, as indigenous peoples. That's awesome. That's really cool. And again, if you could speak to uh, the Métis people right now that are, that are listening across Canada, maybe around the world, they're kind of, you know, living in different parts. What's maybe a word of encouragement of something that you've discovered through this research? Maybe a word of encouragement, a word of, kind of affirmation that you'd love people to really know deeply in their hearts and in their souls uh, of something that you've kind of dug out from this research. We do not send people away. We don't send people away. We are all connected and we all have a family relation with one another. And it's important for us to keep that in mind because it is the program of the government today, as always, to efface those connections and to muddy our sight. We have to go until the water gets clear, as my elder says, and we must revitalize our connections with one another. And that begins with culture. So I would encourage you to investigate your culture and to take it seriously but to also, and most importantly, reconnect with your homeland, your specific homeland, to find your specific relations, reach out to them, and see what you might have in common or what you don't, because it is through this process of reconnection that we will revitalize our contemporary resurgence. And it's important to keep in mind that we will not turn people away. That's amazing. And can you unpack two things? One is, where can people go, you know, website, you know, organizations to, to reconnect with their culture, and where is the best place to go to reconnect with where they're from physically? Well, um, in terms of culture, you can look up your provincial Métis organizations or your local neighborhood Métis office. There's lots of people there who are more than willing and happy to talk to you. That's a start. But if you're interested in going back to the way that I'm going back, like, well, let's go back to the 19th century. Definitely online, you can find the Library and Archives of Canada, RidRiverAncestry.com. And I would suggest spending a weekend looking at where 
one of your family lines migrated throughout this period. It's fascinating to see. And the stories are all the same. They are all the same stories about people who are just trying to move from one area to the other in order to keep food on the table and being thwarted by the government or trying to circumnavigate that by jumping the border, for example, or changing their name, etc., etc. I would look back into your family history in the late 19th century in order to try and more, make more sense of where you belong today. That is incredible. And, and unpack one more thing when you say we don't turn people away. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? It means, that we're, it means that we're related. It means all my relations. All my relations should be understood in this broad sense as encompassing not just our human two-legged friends, but our four-legged and winged friends, our creatures and non-sentient entities, and our, our plants as well. We don't turn people away because we're related. If you can demonstrate to me how you are related to me and vice versa and where we might be from together as a common people, then we are on the same side. And we should keep that in mind and foreground that forever, that we are on the same team and that we are one extended family who should be looking out for each other. Wayne, this is awesome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing so much of what you're discovering. Uh, I'm excited to see a, a published copy of your research, maybe an illustrated version uh, as well, maybe for, for children, oh, yeah. a children's version, uh, as long with an... We could yeah, do a yeah, manga. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be amazing. Um, really appreciate you sharing everything. It, it means a lot. Thank you, Wayne. No, Mio Yak. Thank you. Be well. well. Thank you for joining us uh, this week on the Metis Voices podcast, and we'll see you next time on the show. This has been the Metis Speaker Series podcast. I'm Darian Kovacs. Thanks to Metis Nation BC for making this possible, with funding provided by the Civil Forfeiture Office's Indigenous Healing Stream. You can listen to all of our episodes, learn more about the podcast and sign up to the Métis Nation of BC newsletter to stay up to date on Métis news at metispodcastseries.ca. You can find out more about the music we're playing by Love Life by visiting SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash lovelifeofficial, L-U-V-L-Y-F official, and link in the show notes for your convenience. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast listening device. See you again soon. Mina Kawapa Mitten, thank you, Marcy, for listening.